Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Andrew Gerber, President and Medical Director of Silver Hill. And uh, we are going to wait a few minutes while we uh, welcome our guests today for today's very special Grand Rounds. So uh, people are joining. I see the numbers popping up. And uh, we will get started in just a few moments. It's this very gratifying thing of watching the numbers of participants <laughs> gradually climbing all here on, uh, to, for this terrific Grand Rounds today. So we'll give it another little while before we get started. All right, why don't we get started then? We've got lots, lots of great participants today, and this is a really, very special Grand Rounds. I'm sure folks will be joining us along the way as well, but I want Dr. Katzman to have every uh, possible um, uh, a moment to, to share with us today and to really uh, be part of a wider conversation. So welcome everybody uh, uh, to the final Grand Rounds, uh, the Silver Hill season. And it is very fitting and appropriate that our final Grand Rounds of this season uh, is being delivered by our own Director of Education, uh, Dr. Jeff Katzman. And uh, I'm also very grateful to Dr. Michael Grote, our Chief Clinical Officer, for joining me today uh, as we host uh, Jeff's Grand Rounds. And uh, Michael will be leading off the discussion after Jeff's presentation as well. So let me start by telling you um, uh, some housekeeping things. Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you, remind people the name uh, of our speak, uh, our talk today is Mental Health and Climate Change. I could not imagine a more timely and appropriate topic. Um, housekeeping things. Today's Grand Rounds completes our lecture series for the first half of the year as we take a break from Grand Rounds in July and August. We will be back on September 14th with Dr. Lindsay Smart talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can find all our upcoming Grand Rounds on our hospital-wide uh, website calendar under resources and blogs. Back to today's lecture, we would love to hear from you. Dr. Grote and I will be co-moderating a Q&A discussion with Dr. Katzman at the end of his lecture, and questions are a very important component to our Grand Round. So this is your opportunity to put forward questions and comments to Dr. Katzman. You can submit a question anytime using the Q&A feature that uh, Dr. Grote and I will have open on our screens. When your comments come in, they won't be immediately visible to everybody, but we'll be able to, to look at them and then uh, at the appropriate time lead a discussion around those. Um, you can put your name in if you want, you can do it anonymously, what, whatever works better for you. Um, to receive CME or CEU credits, please complete the evaluation survey that will pop up in the browser when the webinar ends. And finally, disclosures, no planners or individuals in control of content for this educational activity have any relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. As you might imagine, that's a little bit of boilerplate, but bear with us. It is now my great pleasure to introduce and honor uh, our speaker today, Dr. Jeff Katzman. So uh, I hope you'll, you'll forgive, this is gonna be a little more of a personal introduction because I feel very personally um, grateful uh, to uh, call Jeff, uh, our Director of Education, uh, a real mentor to me and a friend. Uh, Jeff, for all of those who know you, is a pretty extraordinary guy. And it's impossible to kind of summarize who he is in just a short introduction, but I will try to do so in order to then turn things over for him. So um, in addition to being Director of Education at Silver Hill Hospital, Jeff, Jeff is a professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He received his undergraduate degree at Stanford and went on to medical school at UC San Diego before going to UCLA for his psychiatric residency. Um, many of you who know him know that Jeff has long roots in, in Los Angeles. In fact, still has family there. And I had the great pleasure of spending time with Jeff during um, a, a trip that, that we both made to LA. And it's, it was so wonderful to meet his family and to, and to see him in his element. Jeff is truly a man of, of, of many areas of the country. Um, 
But um, an important part of this story is what happened after he left LA. So Jeff moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he served in a number of very senior roles in the University of New Mexico system. He was director of behavioral health care for 10 years at the New Mexico VA healthcare system, director of PTSD outpatient and residential programs for four years before that at the West LA VA set, um, medical center, and then went on to be the primary course director and teacher of psychodynamic psychiatry at the University of New Mexico. So he then held a number of senior positions within the department, including education and leadership of education at the University of New Mexico. But if that was the end of the story, I would never have had the benefit of having met Jeff in person. And then for uh, reasons that I, that, that are only, I only consider uh, luck, Jeff and his wife, Joanna, who also gave a grand rounds and is a wonderful uh, a neurologist who focuses on pain, uh, were driving in Connecticut after having dropped off the third of their wonderful children to their new life on the East Coast. And through some uh, divine intervention, uh, were struck with the Im impulsive urge to buy a house in Connecticut. And if you know Jeff and Joanna, they're not impulsive people. So this really must have come from some inner inspiration. And uh, the way Jeff told me the story, he then, after having put a bid on a house, realized, wait, I need a job. And he called up a mutual friend named Dave Lopez, who, who was, a, was a child psychiatrist and analyst mentor of mine at Columbia and a colleague of, of Jeff's at the Academy of, um, uh, of uh, Psychoanalytic Psychiatry. And uh, David said, you got to call Andrew. And uh, it's, the nice coincidence here is when I was first thinking about coming to Silver Hill, I called David too and asked him, what would it be like for me to move to Silver Hill? So David is really an, an instrumental behind the scenes player here. And Jeff called me and I like to think the rest is history. We immediately realized all these great interests we had in common and all these people we knew in common. And most of all, I, I, I just felt so um, excited about the idea of getting to work and collaborate with somebody with, with Jeff's breadth of interest and knowledge about the field and really the heart that he puts into not just education, but in really to the way he thinks clinically about teaching uh, doctors and psychologists and social workers and really every trainee um, about how to be good mental health practitioners. And, and that really is, has been an inspiration to me and already a lot of people here at Silver Hill. But if, if that would be plenty if that was Jeff's sum total story, but there, there is more and, I, and I, I, won't, I won't capture it all. But I'm gonna share my screen for a second because I want you to see this. So Jeff is an author. Jeff has a page on Amazon and you see three of his wonderful books there which I highly recommend to you. The most recent uh, ensemble builds on Jeff's really almost lifelong interest in using the concepts of improv to uh, think about, and really to, I think to sort of translate the principles of good psychotherapy, particularly good kind of psychodynamically oriented inside psychotherapy into the terms that I think are not just understandable, but actually fun for people. We did, a, we did a wonderful session with our board of directors here at Silver Hill, where, where, where Jeff led them in improv. They loved it, and, and, and it's just a lot of fun. But he also wrote a book called Life Unscripted and uh, a, um, a, a novel called The Storymaker. And I would encourage all of you to go to Amazon and, and read Jeff's material. I couldn't resist pulling this up. His book Ensemble has a 4.7 out of 5. That's a pretty nice rating and has some really impressive uh, uh, comments. In the psychiatry field, many of us um, know uh, Glenn Gabbard, who's a real, a real uh, a prominent figure in our field. And he said, this book is an extraordinary contribution published at a time when we need it more than ever. I heartily endorse it for all who are human and especially for those who have forgotten what it means to be human. I love that comment. And I think it's so uh, wonderful, uh, Jeff, that, you, that, that Glenn shared that um, uh, about your book. So um, uh, after all that, uh, I and I could go on, um, uh, Jeff's topic today is another thing that he, I know, and his wife both feel passionately about, and I think we all need to feel passionately about, which is what is the impact of climate change on uh, the world in general, but more specifically on mental health. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to take it from here, 
and look forward to your questions and being back after Jeff's talk. So over to you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for incredibly kind words and uh, an amazing friendship. And um, yeah, it's great to be here uh, on grounds at Silver Hill. So, so thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you, Michael, as, as well for that. And uh, thank you both for being on this panel here today. And I will go ahead and share my screen. You see that okay? All right. We, all right. Thanks again, everybody, for, for joining uh, for this presentation about the impact of climate change on mental health. I have uh, no disclosures or conflicts of interest. I did want to thank my wife, Joanna, who really got me into this area of climate change and mental health, asking me to present on the ECHO uh, program that she leads. So, so it sent me off to do research and led me to many conversations um, with our kids and with psychiatry residents in which I, I learned the passion of the next generation um, in this issue. I'll go ahead and give this talk. If anybody really is interested in climate change in general, climate change communication, um, there's a link right here to the Project ECHO program in which there's a weekly conversation uh, led by my wife who brings guests each week uh, to, uh, to this discussion, and I would highly recommend it. My goals today are to discuss the interplay of climate change and mental health and illustrate some strateg strategies for all of us to communicate appropriate climate uh, preparations, and then to discuss climate anxieties and, and how to address this. Ultimately, I'm uh, thinking that the solution to uh, reducing um, carbon emissions and bringing down the temperature globally is, is somehow related to the way that we are all connected to each other, um, interpersonally and around the world, because ultimately this is a global solution in which we all need to cooperate and understand the perspectives of many and really understand the perspectives of the earth that we live on. And uh, I know from, from hearing from a younger generation much about uh, um, social dating apps. And I ran into this little poem uh, published in the Elephant Journal uh, in which there was this earthly personal ad. So I thought this was a, a good way to start in terms of really underscoring the importance of connection here. So it says, uh, beautiful planet seeks compatible humans for long-term committed relationship. Me, 4.5 billion years old, but look younger, strikingly beautiful and very well endowed highly evolved, intelligent, and accomplished, head of a large extended family, very generous and giving, but don't want to be taken advantage of, seeking a committed but not exclusive relationship. You enjoy forests, mountains, oceans, and diverse plants and animals, are very willing to listen and learn, including from other life forms, are more interested in the common good than personal gain and material wealth, and are ready for a long-term committed partnership based on deep love and mutual respect. Interested? Let's connect. All right. So with that uh, in invocation to the spirit of relationality, I want to start by underscoring the issue. Many of you probably know much and even more of, um, than what I'm going to present right now, but I want to present a little bit about where we are with, re with regard to climate change. The Climate Change National Climate Assessment in 2018 wrote, it is extremely likely that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases, are the dominant cause of observed warming since the mid 20th century. Global warming is causing extreme weather events and that marginalized and vulnerable populations will be most affected. I know most of us have been glued to the January six hearings and, and what happens beat by beat and can watch those for hours. But in the background, there have been just in the past week, many, many headlines underscoring uh, the importance of climate change. Let me actually- Dr. Katzman. Yes. Oh, you've done it. I was just gonna say- I read your mind. How about that? Second wave of stifling heat could bring over 100 high temperature records as heat dome shifts eastward. In New Mexico, landscape scarred by fire bracing for flood. We just pray for rain. Niger is in the eye of the climate crisis and children are starving. 
Uh, one sec. Oops. I uh, have the ribbon here in the way of those two. So India and Bangladesh floods displace millions and kill dozens. Western Europeans wilt in early summer heat wave compounding climate fears. And climate change contributes to the black maternal health crisis. And this one here in uh, uh, Jacobab uh, talks about the heat that's rising as the city is becoming unlivable. Here, you can see what's happening with uh, CO2 levels since pre-industrial times in uh, 1870s, 1880s, and how they've begun to rise and how the slope of the curves uh, is getting steeper and steeper and what's happening in 2020. This is driven by multiple industries, uh, as, as you can see here. And overall, we can see how uh, CO2 levels are rising. Um, and th that's the, the general thing that I wanna bring to all of our attention. And at the same time, the very same time, we see what's happening with the average annual temperature. Um, and since the pre-industrial times, the global temperature has risen about one or 1.5, sorry, one or 1.1 degrees Celsius since 1880 and continues to rise at a faster pace than ever. The so, uh, warming goals and trends uh, are important to understand in that originally in the Paris Climate Agreement in, in 2015, the idea was that uh, the world wanted to stay below uh, two degrees Celsius uh, um, in terms of the rise over pre-industrial levels. But the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned uh, that 2% really wasn't safe and suggested 1.5 as a more prudent goal. And that was uh, concurred by the UN Climate Change Conference in, November, in Scotland in November of 2021, that's really recommending not going over a 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, global goal in a rise in temperature. Regrettably, um, despite some efforts, uh, we're falling short as a world in that we are um, not only um, un unlikely unless we really take major steps to reach the 1.5 or 2 degree goal, but we're on course for projected 3 degree warming. So I wanted to show uh, what that means. This is just a five minute clip because those numbers of 1.5 and 2 um, really become important when you can understand what that means. So uh, here we go. Let me know if you can't hear or see this. Countries around the world have changed what is considered the acceptable limit of global warming. A dire message from climate scientists. They warn unprecedented and even irreversible changes are happening to this planet. Climate change is a fact. It's already happening. It's not going to go Sorry about that. away. For decades, countries participating in United Nations climate talks had set a temperature target. A great deal of impacts, vulnerabilities could be uh, avoided uh, if the world succeeds in two degrees C stabilization. The two degree target is a political choice. Huh? They said the average global temperature rise had to be kept below two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, compared to temperatures in pre-industrial times, to avoid the more serious impacts of climate change. Think extreme heat waves, sea level rise, and ecosystem collapse. So far, the world has warmed 1.1 degrees, according to the UN. But it says we're currently headed toward a 2.2 degrees Celsius increase if countries meet their long-term climate pledges. We'll just yield cataclysmic damage for vulnerable countries. The type of sea level rise that we'll see will engulf entire nations. Many developing countries weren't happy with the goal to limit the global rise in temperature to two degrees. They felt that wouldn't protect them. So the UN funded more research and added a new temperature target of 1.5 degrees to the 2015 Paris Agreement. Majority of the world is really now on board with 1.5 and have realized that that is the limit that we should be trying to adhere to. Half a degree doesn't sound like much of a difference. So why are some countries saying a 1.5 degree limit is so important? And is it even feasible?
1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming causes clearly discernible increases in the intensity and frequency of hot extremes of heavy rainfall and drought. Climate scientists say half a degree could make a dramatic difference in the number of people exposed to health and safety risks. Global population exposed to increase water shortages would be 50% less under one and a half degrees, 10, two degrees levels of warming. And it could save about 10 million people from experiencing deadly and damaging flooding from sea level rise. But what about impacts on other life on Earth? Many more plants and animals are expected to be wiped out from places they currently live with two degrees of warming compared to, compared to 1.5 degrees. And coral reefs and some coastal ecosystems could be almost completely destroyed. This would also have devastating impacts on people. Tourism uh, is almost entirely dependent on our coastal ecosystems. And with that type of sea level rise, it would mean decimation of, of entire economies. Everything I know and everyone I love is in the hands of all of us. Even at 1.5 degrees, the world will still suffer from climate impacts, but they'll be less devastating than the ones at 2 degrees. It's no um, picnic in the park at 1.5 for us. You know, we're already seeing extreme loss of coastlines, catastrophic hurricane impacts, coral bleaching events, ocean acidification. This average rise in temperatures will be felt more in some regions than others. It may actually mean five degrees warming in some regions in the Arctic at one and a half degrees Celsius, and it might mean seven degrees of warming in some of the regions of the Arctic at two degrees of, of global warming. Canada, and especially its Arctic region, is warming much faster than the world average and will continue to do so if we don't stop it. According to climate experts, the world still has a chance at capping the temperature rise at 1.5 degrees. We know what we need to do and um, we have the means, the technological and economical means to do it. We can do it if political leaders really step up and the global community is committed to achieving this. All right, uh, so I think that gives us some images about what, what we can think might start to happen uh, as we continue to see temperature rise um, beyond 1.1 where we are right now, even to the 1.5 level. And we've all been struggling for the last couple of years with how we can cooperate as cities, as countries, as a world uh, to address the pandemic. And there are some common factors in understanding climate change and the pandemic and how we address these. Like, um, like the pandemic, um, we will see increased utilization of the healthcare system and tr a tremendous mental health impact as a result of climate change. But unlike the pandemic, there is no vaccine or mask mandate that's going to help flatten some of the curves that I showed you and will take even greater integrated efforts. Additionally, the problem is that the benefits really accrue primarily in the distant future and they're globally distributed, um, undermining really many places' willingness to undertake them. And additional policies are really important in addressing climate change that have been um, really shown to be critical in the literature, including improving food systems, the built environment, land use practices, and access to planning, family planning services, as well as the education of women and girls around the world, in, in which the literature, when you look at that, really describes uh, the importance of half of the world's population really understanding how to develop solutions uh, toward, uh, toward preventing climate change and what to do in disasters, and that more often uh, the solutions come from, from women leaders. The silver lining is that any city or state or nation that does invest in renewable uh, electricity and energy 
will realize benefits in terms of cleaner air and water, healthier people, reduced healthcare costs, and an enhanced employment and GDP. And the University of Wisconsin did a, a modeling example. And they said that if the state of Wisconsin were to meet 100% of its energy needs with clean energy produced in state, there would be over 161,000 net jobs in the state, an increased state GDP by nearly 5%, an increased state tax revenue of more than $500 million a year, and of an avoidance of human health damage that could cost up to $21 billion a year. So I'm here um, with that background of climate change and what it looks like and what some of the numbers are and what some of the curves look like. I'm here really to, to talk about the impact on mental health care because that's what most of us do. And we don't necessarily think about uh, climate change and the impact of climate change in our assessment and treatment of patients. But I have a growing belief that this is really a, a critical, critical thing that we put in, uh, in our minds as to how we assess and interact with our patients. I wanna talk about extreme weather events, chronic climate changes, the anticipation of climate changes, vulnerable populations, personal characteristics of individual at risk, children, and then some coping strategies that are effective and harmful about how we build resilience and the role of healthcare providers and some effective communication strategies and why that's so important that we know those. So we start with the extreme weather events. We can see that uh, since 1980, um, compared to 1980, in 2020, there was a quadrupling of the billion dollar climate events. And here's a map of, of where they all are or were in 2020. These extreme weather events are characterized by severe heat waves and wildfires and floods and hurricanes and tsunamis. And we know that a single event uh, produces fewer mental health consequences than repeated events. And we would anticipate from looking historically at the literature around these events, that the risks are the development of PTSD and adjustment disorders, mood disorders, substance use disorders, and sleep problems as well as suicidal ideation and attempts and completions. But those are kind of global diagnoses. And we know really from, from the COVID-19 pandemic that there was really the development of a COVID-19 specific stress syndrome that had to do with the characteristics of the virus and what we were all going through and continue to. And these were worries about our personal health, financial worries, xenophobia, um, some symptoms of traumatic stress, some compulsive checking and, and reassurance that these were um, more specific characteristics. And the point of that is that uh, each of these extreme weather events carries with it some specific characteristics in terms of what we might expect in, in terms of people's reactions, depending on what happened. As well the, as the secondary issues uh, involved in these extreme weather events often lead to coping strategies that can cause additional problems like substance use as well as uh, forced migration from, from where people have lived. Um, individuals often have to act quickly and don't have time to grieve or really process what's happened to them. They um, become distance from people they know. They have a sense of detachment and depression and pessimism as a result of uh, leaving their home. Many have financial hardships with a loss of business, business and demand for their pro, uh, products. And many have insufficient food, wa water, and problems with the infrastructure. When populations are displaced, there's a stress of a new environment that's often temporary and barely habitable in and of itself. There are enhanced risks of infection um, when that happens during a pandemic, like we've seen over the past couple of years. And people are exposed to new languages and cultures and prejudices and biases which, uh, which exacerbate uh, the mental health issues that they're already facing. So uh, some, about 25 to 50% of individuals will experience negative mental health outcomes as a result of these extreme weather events. Um, they'll diminish over time, but not for everyone. And there are some particular risks to think about, including um, there are not uh, surprising most of them, such as the magnitude of the event and the exposure to the injury or death of a loved one, um, 
being female and being younger seems to put somebody at more risk. People of uh, lower socioeconomic status and less education generally have less access um, to health care and to mental health care. Um, and that often involves individuals uh, in countries who have a minority status, as well as individuals who have psychiatric history, family instability, and inadequate social support. Uh, you can get a copy of these slides as well uh, after this. Uh, we'll send this out and they have the references at the bottom of each slide. The risk factors for uh, developing mental health symptoms include, as I said, residents of low and middle income countries who are especially vulnerable to these outcomes and often have ex increased exposure to these extreme weather events with high level of poverty and lack of access to services. If we start uh, with extreme heat as an example of a, these extreme weather events, we can, we're going into a summer and we can think about what was happening about a year ago at this time. And we can call up images of heat maps that we were shown um, on the news. And we can remember places like uh, Portland, Oregon that had record breaking heat. I think it was 10 degrees over um, what had been seen before and individuals were moved um, into temporary housing uh, centers. There is a, a real disparity in, in what happens as a result of this uh, heat, extreme heat problem in that uh, low income neighborhoods and communities with higher black, Hispanic and Asian populations often experience significantly more urban heat than wealthier and predominantly white neighborhoods within a vast majority of US counties. For 71% of these counties, the land surface temperature in these communities has a higher rate of poverty and can be up to four degrees or even Celsius or seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer compared to the richest neighborhoods during the summer months. And this is due to increased man-made surfaces, higher density of people with less trees and other vegetation. The American Psychiatric Association has taken a position around extreme heat in particular. And uh, Vivian Pender, the immediate past president of the APA, uh, said that while many people are still coping with mental health challenges from the pandemic, exposure to extreme, even unprecedented heat can worsen psychiatric symptoms. The APA believes the impacts of climate change, such as these extreme heat waves, pose a threat to public health, including mental health. And study after study has shown some really interesting things to think about um, as that we have accelerating heat waves of, uh, of higher degrees. In 2018, there was a study in China that showed there was an increased number of outpatient hospital vis visits for mental health on days of extreme heat. Um, 10 years prior in an Australian study, uh, the admissions for mental health increased by 7.3% when the temperature was over 26.7 degrees Celsius uh, when they looked at the 10 years prior. We know that suicide rates increase with heat waves, heat waves, though that's variable across countries and seems to be more specifically associated where the humidity uh, is higher, that women and youth are at greater risk. And people with mental illness are three times more likely to run the risk of death from a heat wave than those without mental illness. Um, in terms of pregnancy, we get concerned about heat waves due to lower, lower average birth weight and increased incidence of preterm birth during uh, times of extreme heat. And we think of, of course about problems with reduced schooling and economic activities and the literature described behavioral problems and even reduced IQ um, when measured at times of extreme heat. Higher temperatures are associated with increased incidence of major depression. And I think this is really important and is, um, starts to build on a, a big point I want to make here. Higher temperatures than usual, especially in June and July, are associated with an outbreak of aggressive crimes and massive increase in the number of shootings. Heat waves are associated with greater collective violence, generally through mechanisms of diminishing resources. Individuals with a diagnosis of schizophrenia are 
at even greater risk in that many antipsychotics and antidepressant uh, medications interfere with temperature regulation and increase the risk of heat stroke. There seems to be evidence as well that individuals with schizophrenia have greater difficulty compensating for heat stress. And people with diabetes, um, which is uh, often a side effect of some of our, met our antipsychotic medications, are at greater risk for heat complications due to an interference with glucose metabolism. Exposure and dehydration um, are also a, a risk, of course, when individuals are experiencing homelessness. So this is an interesting example from San Francisco uh, that this group made in, in that we know that an average uh, house, uh, urban house, uses about 115, 158 gallons of water a day. And to maintain a sanitary lifestyle, an individual needs to use at least 50 liters a day. At times of emergencies, uh, in a UN published study, often people are limited to 16 liters a day. The 2021 Coalition of Homelessness report showed that greater than 60% of the homeless in San Francisco do not meet the 16 liter a day standard in terms of water that's available. And particularly this is because the water filling stations are on the west side of the city, far from where the homeless encampments are in the Tenderloin and Bayview um, in the Mission. So it may be that we should start to think about talking about extreme heat um, particularly if it's a problem where we live. We may want to, as clinicians, talk to our patients about the risks and symptoms of dehydration, of heat exhaustion and heat stroke, and wonder with them about how they stay cool and find shade and get water, uh, and discuss changes with diabetes in, in sugar levels, and, and wonder with them about the impact of, that heat has had in their life, about the feeling of anger, during extreme heat that can happen to all of us and how to cope with it and wonder about other emotional changes that they've noticed during times of extreme heat. So I come from New Mexico, as Andrew said, and um, there we, we worry about heat and we worry about fires as I'll get into. Uh, here we, we worry a little more, I'm um, finding about water. Um, so, Flooding around the world is associated with PTSD, of course, and other major mental health disorders, even in uh, areas neighboring the flood. There is a greater of intensity of, the greater the intensity of the flooding event uh, is associated with higher levels of PTSD. The biggest uh, problems in terms of loss of life during a flooding event are from drowning and electrocution, but the mental health problems that are exacerbated come from things like forced migration, loss of loved ones, damage to the infrastructure, ensuing diseases, overcrowded facilities, and loss of access to mental health resources. Community pr uh, preparation has been shown to be critical in the development of resilience. So um, like what we've done here at Silver Hill with a community resilience campaign, that's extremely important to developing a resilient community. I, we're all familiar with this idea of global sea level rise. Here's a graph demonstrating what's happening. And since 1880, the sea level rise has been eight, eight to nine inches. In 2020, that set a new record far above the level that was seen in 1993. The rate of sea level rise is accelerating. It has more than doubled per year throughout most of the 20th century um, uh, since the time of uh, of 2006 to 2015. And in many locations along the US coastline, the high tide flooding is now 300% to more than 900% more frequent than it was 50 years ago. If we're able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the US sea level in 2100 is projected to be around two feet higher on average than it was in 2000. But we're on a pathway with higher greenhouse gas emissions and rapid ice sheet collapse in the Arctic for um, a modeling that suggests uh, that, that sea level rise could be 7.2 feet by 2100 and 13 feet by 2150. And of, of course, that's what affects us the most here in Connecticut. 
in that 61% of people in Connecticut or, uh, or 61% of Connecticut's 3.6 million people live in coastal communities prone to flooding. And additional 30% of the population work in coastal areas. The projections show by 2080 that Connecticut could lose up to 24,000 acres of land due to sea level rise and portions of coastal communities and sections of I-95, rail lines, local airports are expected to experience tidal flooding with storm action due to increased sea level. Bridgeport has currently experienced six inches of sea level rise since 1965, which is higher than the current global rates. And uh, predictions show that Connecticut sea level rise could increase 1.5 feet by 2050 and up to three feet by 2100. So this is something we had to talk about with our patients in that we wonder, have they prepared for the next likely flooding event? Um, are there medications and supplies in a place that they can get quickly when they leave their house? Um, if they have a home, do they have insurance? Where would they go? Um, and how would they communicate if cell phone towers were down? Um, and, and are there any issues that we should think about together uh, for particularly for people in their home with mental health conditions. Uh, extreme weather events, events involving a wind such as uh, tornadoes and hurricanes have been shown also to have both uh, medical, of course, and mental health impact. They increase, there's an increase in rates of cardiovascular disease um, following uh, an ex extreme event invol involving uh, a tornado or hurricane. We, we see prenatal maternal stress and depression and higher levels of anxiety and fear and sadness um, in infants and small children. There's lack of access to medical care. The populations are exposed to contaminated floodwaters and there are consequences of material damage, including substance use and mental health issues. People living in affected areas show higher levels of suicide and suicidal ideation. In the Hurricane Maria example, uh, when, when studied, those who were impacted showed a 26% rate of suicidal ideation and the, uh, with additional consequences of a loss of social support, job insecurity, and a loss of belongings. The, uh, there were tremendous consequences from the lack of power for extended periods of time and potential physical damage and mental health disorders uh, were often even seen one year uh, following the disaster. One in six people developed PTSD and half of them developed uh, anxiety or mood disorder, including depression. So when thinking about people who have survived a hurricane or a tornado uh, or who live in that area, we wonder with them about, do they have a place to go? Does your family have a communication plan? Have you prepared to get out quickly? Are there issues with your home that should be considered like trees? And are there individuals with mental health conditions that should be talked to about potential plans? And we'll get into the idea that actually, this is a communication really that best happens from clinicians. So this is a, a issue near and not so dear to my heart and I'm happy to be in Connecticut and not in New Mexico right now. Um, this is a view two weeks before moving um, from our porch. Um, the, this is the Rio Grande. This is called uh, the Bosque, which means wetland forest. And this, uh, you can see the trees on either side and, and they're coming really close to our house. This is a daytime view and a nighttime view. Many of you have read about uh, the horrific wildfires in New Mexico that have really destroyed the land of, uh, for people who've lived there for seven generations. Uh, and it, it was, as I say, getting incredibly close to home. Uh, during the years uh, following a fire, there are an increase in mental health issues. These are generally also uh, mental health problems in general, PTSD, psychosomatic illnesses, and alcohol abuse. And these can be delayed in onset. When looking at some specific examples like the Australian bushfires, one year after the event, 42% uh, of the population who were exposed uh, would be classified as having a potential psychiatric issue. After the California wildfires last year, 33% showed symptoms of major depression and 24% showed symptoms of PTSD. So 
So we can think about also the development of new diseases connected with climate change. Um, still unclear really if COVID-19 is in some way related to climate change, uh, but we uh, are told through the literature that there's an anticipation of new disease vectors in association with climate change. The 2010 uh, quadrennial defense report, the Pentagon recognized climate change as a factor worthy of consideration in national security planning in that warmer temperatures can also exacerbate the introduction and proliferation of heat related illness and disease vectors such as mosquitoes into vulnerable regions. The 2014 climate change adaptation roadmap warned of the emergence of new strains of disease and that climate change was a threat multiplier that will aggravate the stresses, stressors abroad. The World Health Organization released this statement, as man-made climate change has taken hold over the last four decades, dozens of new infectious diseases have emerged or begun to threaten new regions, including Zika and Ebola, bubonic plagues spread by rats and fleas, is predicted to increase with warmer springs and wetter summers. Anthrax, whose spores are released by thawing permafrost, could spread farther as a result of strong winds. So those are um, extreme weather events, more in the area of a, an event, a single event, but we know climate change also results in more chronic situations like droughts, desertification, the rising sea levels that I mentioned, and pollution, and homes often can become uninhabitable. Individual experience a loss of place, economic instability, they are forced into, to migrate into camps and there can be infighting between groups for resources and a deterioration of cultures and families and a loss of a sense of connection to other individuals, the community and to the earth. In terms of the development of mental health conditions, the literature describes that monthly temperatures greater than 30 degrees Celsius increase the probability of mental health difficulties by 0.5% for each degree. And there's, um, when looked at over a 10 year period in California, the suicide rate increased um, as the average temperature of one degree Celsius increase, that corresponded to a 0.82% increase in the suicide rate. And a one degree Celsius of five-year warming is associated with a 2% increase in the pre prevalence of mental health issues showing us really that climate change is related to what we do. And, and we really need to uh, think about how it affects the numbers of people we see and, and what people will be dealing with when they come in to see us. On a biologic level, uh, chronic climate changes involving temperature rise can, can affect us biologically in that heat suppresses thyroid hormones resulting in functional hypothyroidism and lethargy. Dehydration can cause cognitive changes and stimulate growth hormone and prolactin, which can also cause lethargy. Chronic pollution uh, has also been shown to be associated with cognitive impairment in the elderly and behavioral problems in children uh, related to impulsivity and attention problems. The suicide rate increases with levels of air pollution in both short-term and long-term exposure, as well as visits to psychiatric emergency rooms. And it may be through the mechanism of increasing ozone levels, which actually impact uh, the serotonin system. So in general, I'm presenting an idea also in the background here that the multiple epidemics and pandemics that we're dealing with impact each other. So, so that climate change may have something to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we, in terms of, of the evolution of the virus, but we certainly know that as people were crowded into camps from migration due to climate change, there was a greater exposure to, um, to, to the virus. We know that there was an epidemic of loneliness described prior to COVID-19 in that individuals experience self-described loneliness that the medical risk to them and, uh, and the mental health risk was equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And most of us have had the experience of, of how the pandemic impacted uh, and, and led to a state of loneliness as do experiences of climate change when people are forced into new communities. I talked a little bit 
about how climate change may be related to uh, violence as the temperature rises. And we think about uh, um, struggles for resources and the evolution of war and uh, the evolution of ideas of um, different kinds of people and, and from different backgrounds and uh, as people struggle for resources and the development of racism. And we've talked about the increase in substance use and mental health as a result, issues as a result of climate change. So these converging pandemics really require cooperative solutions between all of us, between citizens of the world, understanding each other and each other's and our uh, other people's point of view and perspectives to try to reach solutions and uh, development of a sense of personal and community resilience. We have also a, an emotional reaction just to the environment changing and an Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht described this as solastalgia, which is a chronic sense of distress as a result of an exposure to negative environmental changes and described also these psychotheratic syndromes of eco-anxiety and eco-paralysis, eco-nostalgia. I showed you some pictures of the Rio Grande on fire. Um, this was what it looked like when we first moved into our, our house, again, from our balcony, that's the full Rio Grande. And uh, all the, the papers in New Mexico talk about are the drying up of the Rio Grande, um, that it could dry completely as it runs through the city. Um, and, you know, there's some bias here as, as the lens. Um, the picture wasn't as good, but uh, I think if you look closely, you can see that the water level has fallen um, in the Rio Grande. And it's a little bit seasonal, but um, but this is what it's starting to look like with predictions that the, the river, if, not, if something, if actions really, strong actions aren't taken by the world, that the river really um, may dry up. So, I mentioned early on about this idea of climate anxiety, um, which is really an existential anxiety uh, that is more notable in people who are likely to be affected, which includes vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations across the globe, uh, cultures who historically have a greater connection to the earth and younger people who feel that the world may end during their lifetime. we look at the evidence for climate anxiety, it's been really studied around the world. In one Australian study, 39% of their modal response uh, um, was, was about, um, was that climate change will be the most serious problem facing in the world in the future if nothing's done to stop it. And 86% showed some level of distress as a result. In a study at Yale, 69% of Americans were somewhat worried and 29% very worried. In European studies, 20 to 40% have described themselves as very worried about climate change. In Greenland, 38% felt fear moderately or strongly. In a, nine, a study of nine South Pacific islands, distress had reached the level it, that it was impairing functioning in 80%. 87% of the population. And in a US study by Clayton, 17 to 27% reported that climate anxiety had some actual impact on their ability to function. Uh, that study only assessed adults and younger people we know show a greater um, degree and severity of anxiety. And an additional climate anxiety study in the US, 85% of 10 to 12 year old children expressed fear about the changing climate uh, during their lifetime. A big study of climate anxiety involved 10,000 individuals from around the world who were aged 16 to 25. And, and there were a thousand participants in each of the countries listed right there. 59% of them were very or extremely worried and 84% were at least moderately worried. More than 45% of respondents said their feelings about climate change negatively affected their daily life and functioning. 75% said they think the future is frightening. 83% said that they think people have failed to take care of the planet. And climate anxiety and distress were correlated with perceived inadequate government response and associated feelings of betrayal. 
has led the younger generation to really question why bring a child into a world that's disappearing and to, and, and to talk about the burden of carbon emissions brought on by each child who was born, which is an interesting thing to look at. If we were to, to do something about climate change personally, uh, if we live car free, we save uh, 2.4 tons of carbon per year. If we eat a plant-based diet, it's 0.82 uh, tons of carbon saved per year. If we don't take an Atlantic flight, that's 1.6. But having one less child results in 58.6% of carbon saved per year. If we compare um, children around the world, a Bangladesh child only adds 56 metric tons of carbon to their parents' carbon legacy over their lifetime. Well, an American child in comparison adds 9,441 to theirs. So this has led to groups like the birth strike movement whose members have declared they're not going to have kids because of the state of the ecological crisis and inaction from governments to address this existential threat. In general, uh, children are at greater risk as, uh, as a result of climate change. They are more vulnerable to the effects, the direct effects of climate change. They have a stronger psychological reaction, including PTSD and depression and sleep disorders. They're more vulnerable uh, to heat due to their body's incomplete uh, ability to thermoregulate. And there's really a possibility for longer term uh, sequelae at, as a result of early psychological experiences of trauma. So that's a lot of um, doom and gloom really. So what, what can we do about this in, in our profession, in our professional roles? So I wanna talk about education and advocacy and modeling um, how we talk to people, to patients who present and ultimately learning from younger generations and how to build um, resilience and take care of ourselves. So we as clinicians are accustomed to talking about public health issues, about car seats and seat belts and vaccinations and sexuality, but we get nervous talking about things that might be politically involved. But the bottom line is that patients trust healthcare providers um, for emerging scientific information. That's who they turn to and trust with issues that have taken on a, a political divide. Um, Here's an interesting quote that says, clinicians should begin by asking questions of patients rather than immediately trying to provide alternative information and recommendations. Trust must be earned by respecting patients' knowledge, perspectives, and lived experience and inviting them into a conversation. This is difficult and time consuming, but it's the best strategy to build trust. Yet clinicians cannot do this in isolation. In their viewpoint, Jan and colleagues emphasize the need for healthcare organizations to build trust with patients and the communities they serve and to make this a measurable strategic priority. So these are a lot of citations showing that research, uh, showing research that shows that physicians and other healthcare professionals are highly trusted sources of information around the world and that pre presenting information about the health harms of climate change is an effective communication strategy that leads to enhanced issue engagement. Most major medical organizations are now advocating education, pre and post licensure education about climate change, though not much exists like in the medical school curriculum. These are some groups uh, that I know of in psychiatry who are involved with the climate change issues and education. And a particularly interesting one is the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, whose mission is we are psychiatrists raising awareness about the impacts of climate change on mental health and doing what we can to mitigate, mitigate climate distress. I think we can also model uh, for other people in that we're all physicians, uh, nurses, social workers, psychologists. Um, we have multiple roles and we have roles as family members, as community members, as professionals and citizens. And grounded in these roles, um, this group, uh, Malbec, um, argues that we, we should really help to achieve the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And many health professionals are already personally inclined to get involved in relevant education 
and advocacy issues. So we need to know and to talk to our patients about self-care, about how to manage the anxiety and anger that emerge during extreme weather events, how we communicate. We, it would probably be good for most of us to know about psychological first aid and what that is given the um, predictable rise in these extreme weather events and how to think about community resilience and prevention. Generally, we've learned from the pandemic, all of us, uh, we've talked about self-care, really ad nauseum, and um, some important concepts that I hear over and over again are to think about having calm and transparent conversations, particularly when people are very, very angry, to think about what we can do to honor our genu genuine emotions and to validate, validate those around us, to limit the news, on, uh, limit and separate work hours, and think about engaging in things uh, that give us satisfaction to, to give us energy to deal with what's around us, uh, to find our, our space and to identify passivity and fatigue when we feel overwhelmed and, and to try to do something about that. We know that in the pandemic, there was really a time at the beginning where people were very, very anxious. What happens if my parent gets sick? What happens if this, what happens if this? And, and the best I heard about this was to make a plan. And uh, I will do this if this happens, I will do this if this happens and to try to answer the question as opposed to letting the obsession linger and really to turn to that plan and have it, uh, have it close at hand. I'm not gonna get into this uh, right now, but we all, uh, many of us know about things to uh, teach people in managing acute anxiety. I know this became very important for me when talking to hospitalists who were moving from ventilator to ventilator at the heart of the COVID crisis and, and um, watching people die and then having to go work with somebody else and these various ways to bring down the level of stress and anxiety become really important to teach people. Psychological first aid reminds us to ask somebody if they already have something that they do and if they'd like to learn something. Um, a quick one is like this four, seven, eight breathing where we breathe in for a count of four and we hold it for a count of seven and then we exhale for a count of eight and doing that for a few rounds really can bring down somebody's level of anxiety as well as some of these other uh, interventions, including um, really helping somebody become present when, when their anxiety is overwhelming by naming five things that they see, uh, naming five things that they hear, and then naming five sensations that their awareness really to try to bring somebody who's dissociating really um, amidst a crisis um, back, back to the present. Yeah, I'm gonna go into this discussion of relationships, which are really important to think about in times of disasters, uh, which is uh, what we will predict to see more of and what we can know about and what we can teach. Um, and one thing is uh, to talk to people and to talk to ourselves about the relationships in, in our life and who we want to be checking in with. And, and I think we know too from the COVID crisis that it really did offer an opportunity to reach out to people and to wonder, um, how are you doing with this? Uh, more online groups emerge uh, that weekly checked in with each other. And even there's a, a suggestion that can be very helpful to make a spreadsheet of the people that are important to your in your life. Uh, uh, Vivek Murthy talks about three circles of connection that we all have. The, the most inner circle being the intimate connections that we have, which really are around eight people. Um, a second level of connections, which are about 40 people. And those are the people that we traditionally would see at work um, or generally fairly often maybe get together for a cup of coffee during, um, uh, during the week. And then on an, in an outer circle, there may be a thousand or more people that we're connected to around the world in some way. Um, and that in, in some way we rely on connections in each of these circles. For, for many people during COVID in quarantine and isolation, there was a lot of connection on the inner inner level, but people began to miss those outer levels of connection. So we want to become very mindful of our relationships, particularly with the threats of disasters, um, and check in with people who are close to us and wonder how we can connect if we're far away, um, and, and think about really what are the most valuable 
uh, good and positive experiences that we can recall uh, from family of origin experiences. And we, and we need to be talking to our children um, in open ways with new possibilities and, and to think about getting help uh, when that's needed. In general, some rules of, uh, from the fair fighting world are, are uh, that there are certain ways that we need to talk to each other and that's using collaborative discourse and the word, words of yes and, and when we um, say no or but to people that we love and we're close to when we really are relying um, on one another, that's very difficult. We wanna avoid in those situations or any situation uh, when we're fighting with people we really care about to avoid the words never and always. We wanna stay with one issue at a time that we're discussing even heatedly um, and be able to reflect back the state of mind of our partner. These are, when we rely on each other, these are become very, very important in, in terms of maintaining a sense of collaboration and teamwork and to develop really a space for what is possible um, as opposed to uh, taking, uh, pulling each other down. When we do feel angry and frustrated, which is um, so much more common during these experiences as I've talked about, uh, we wanna be able to take a pause um, to take a walk, to get into nature. There was even one study I ran into in which looking at water um, became very, very critical. Um, and actually staring at water in a bathtub um, had some degree of positive effect. We want to be able to distract ourselves when, when we're feeling angry and, in order to um, reset and do whatever that is that's helpful for our, ourselves and also spend time with the feeling of anger and try to understand what this is coming from and connect in general to our feelings through music and writing and talking to people who we trust um, with our vulnerable experiences uh, and, and with our closest contacts really so that we can honor the feelings and they don't overwhelm us. We know from COVID as well that um, in these kinds of critical times, peer support systems are really important, but what really emerged was that teams like to talk with each other. When you have a uh, psychiatrists like me come in and work with the team and, and I'm not actually dealing um, with what they're all dealing with. It, it can be seen like a foreigner coming in, but when teams are allowed to debrief and one person in particular has been taught how to, um, how to check in with the group and is skilled in psychological first aid, for example, um, that's very, very helpful. As is the uh, battle buddy program that was, uh, um, that pairs individuals in, in a workplace to check in with each other at the beginning and end of the day and um, various peer support systems in Indiana and in Arizona um, emerged and are described in the literature with similar premises that we need to um, try to develop a system whereby we are connecting with each other individually and on teams. Uh, during the COVID um, pandemic, I immerse myself in psychological first aid because, um, and realize that it actually is very good to have some guidelines. We're mental health um, folks, but it doesn't mean we're very good at knowing how to deal with crises and disasters. Um, and it is based on these premises of safety and calmness and restoring a sense of um, self and community eff efficacy and connection and hope. You can go online uh, for training in psychological first aid and these are the modules. They are about contact and engagement. So making contact with somebody and, and how do we do that and how do we assure their safety and comfort and um, stabilizing um, psychologically and physically their situation. Um, how do we get information by understanding somebody else's perspective and what they need? You know, um, it really could be that we think somebody's really upset because their house is destroyed and we're thinking about where they want to live, but what is on their top of mind is that their cat is gone. And we need to, to understand if we're working in these situations, what, uh, what is really at somebody's top of mind when we're gathering this inf information and then getting practical assistance with those kinds of issues, as well as then connecting with social supports, providing information about coping and teaching some of those things like I just went through about managing anxiety um, and linking with collaborative services. So I wanna end with how do we address this question of climate anxiety? And there are a few different paradigms that people talk about. So one is to be problem focused and to just focus on the problem 
when somebody's talking to us about uh, their climate anxiety. And that tends to involve somebody um, with higher levels of negative affect. If it's a more emotional focused therapy, we tend to um, teach people how to regulate the emotion, but that can be really dismissive and shutting down the uh, around the actual issue. So therapies that are more meaning focused tend to result in more engagement and more hope. So these therapies are linked to higher env environmental engagement and efficacy, life satisfaction and positive affect. Uh, some therapies that are linked to nature are very, very helpful for, for people who have who are describing a lot of climate anxiety, as are wondering together about activism and how to get engaged uh, in this issue. And most important um, for older people like me is to validate uh, the fears and anxieties of upcoming generations who we're handing this planet to. <clears throat> and, and if we deny the existence of this anxiety and the existence of this issue, um, it is uh, infuriating and not helpful. So, so that we have to think about this also within the context of a psychotherapy and how we, uh, how we relate to this. Dr. Grote, who will come back on here in a minute, was uh, kind enough to send me this article, um, which was really amazing about these, was a qualitative assessment of 10 Swedish adults in therapy who came in for climate change related emotional distress. And, uh, and they were interviewed fairly extensively about their psychotherapy and what was helpful and what was not. And the most important therapeutic factors for these 10 people were their therapist's knowledge about climate change and competence in coping with it, the validation of climate change related emotions and uh, learning tools to manage these emotions, as well as connecting the psychotherapy to their own personal values and action orientation. So an encouragement if somebody really is somebody who wants to help with solutions about how to, how to do that. Uh, and with that uh, came for these 10 people, uh, an enhanced sense of meaning and sense of community. Um, and, and that was, those were considered very, very important. Ultimately, we learn about um, Maslow's pyramid and how to work with people at different levels. And I think I would just want to end by saying um, we can think about the bottom of the pyramid and, and physiologic issues that, um, that present. But ultimately, we're, if we're sitting on a planet, we, none of us have a place to live um, or, or food to eat if our planet is disappearing. And so this is so fundamental to all of us that I think it's important that as clinicians, as mental health clinicians, we think about it and we, um, we, we become a little smart about how to think about it, how to think about coping with climate change um, and how to become part of the solution. So with that, I uh, welcome questions and comments uh, and ideas that people have. Thank you, Jeff. That was just a tour de force. What an amazing, um, compilation of, of, of powerful facts, uh, ideas, and things that we all need to be thinking about. So I am delighted that uh, Dr. Michael Grote, our Chief Clinical Officer, has agreed to join to launch the discussion. We already have a bunch of questions coming in, uh, but why don't we start with you, Michael, and share some of your thoughts, and then I can uh, organize some of the questions and, and start reading those uh, to Jeff in our remaining time. Over to you, Michael. Okay, great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you know, Jeff, I want to echo uh, Andrew's uh, comments that this is truly a tour de force and, and a sobering one. And not only are you presenting to us the you know, devastating impact of the changes of climate worldwide, you also, I think, very helpfully outline some steps that we can take. And I am particularly appreciative of the ways you talk about the peer support, the ways we can help support each other as we face, uh, I, would, I think what you're talking about is an existential type of anxiety, which um, is perhaps one of the more difficult kinds of anxieties for us humans to face, which is you know, that we can't, uh, that the privilege of living with a sense of infinite uh, capacity to enjoy the planet Earth is now under siege 
And I think your, your talk you know, beautifully illustrates that. So you know, thank you for the review, which is you know, a, a painful kind of review, uh, but also the, the hope that you provide that we can find a way to cope with it. Um, two two uh, you know, particular comments I have. One is that you know, as I think about this issue of uh, you know, the change that might be necessary, and we've had, you know, as part of our Grand Round series, we've been thinking about change. How do we, as humans, face behavioral change? And you know, I think on the one hand, we're talking about people who come to us who are saying, I see a problem. I am not in denial about this. I, I'm actually distressed by it. And then at the same time, there has been inaction about things we have known. And so it leaves questions in my mind about the ambivalences, about the resistances to knowing, and you know, the ways in which as patients present to us in psychotherapy, we're gonna have those who are very able to engage with us directly about their anxiety, like we may be helping them contain it and educate them and supporting them as you beautifully illustrate. There may be those though who are much more mixed about it, much more resistant. Perhaps they're telling us things in psychotherapy sessions that indicate kind of a disavowal of these threats. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on dealing with that kind of continuum that we may face clinically. Because I loved your point about, you know, it, this can quickly be cast as a political issue, but also though as a psychotherapeutic issue in terms of how people cope with and deal with certain kinds of realities uh, in their lives. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful question that I really wish I had a great answer to, but I think, well, I think no, it's a great question. I, I think one, one thing is it's, it's sobering to be a really older and a grown up uh, in, in these <laughs> times. You know, I'm not as good at, as my kids in so many things, um, in all social media apps and ways that people communicate and about very important issues like climate change. Um, and, and so there, there is this, um, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash kind of idea of like, of listening to our children and teacher parents that I think is important that we as parents, um, actually in order to preserve really the connection with our kids, have that opportunity um, to, to make these conversations available and, and see that we are, um, online with this issue and educatable and, and all of that. And I think, as you said, um, really, I think this is ultimately a mentalizing question. Um, by having really a, a not knowing stance really a little bit, um, we can learn from our patients who are coming in, um, coming in anxious. I, I, um, I, I think when people come in with disavowal, I think, similarly like curiosity about about that about curiosity about how, how people are able to push this away and what works for them and how are they doing this can start to um, challenge a little bit of the defense I the defenses I know um uh, Joanna my wife has created also on echo the a vaccination hesitancy echo in which people call in and they talk about these are doctors who call in, how do I talk to my patients about their hesitancy to get a vaccine? And ultimately this becomes a question of like, how are you doing that? How, how are you pushing away um, science and what are you afraid of? And really getting to somebody's frame and state of mind to, to wonder with them and, and um, to start to face a reality none of us wanna face. I mean, I think all of us are watching, like I said, the, the January 6th hearings and what's happening while there are all these things happening in the world involved with climate that continue to happen, but we just kind of, um, many of us blip in and out of it as an important issue. You're like a leader though, Michael. I mean, you're, you lead a life really, I know in many ways committed to this, committed to this issue that I admire that affects me. Thank you, thank, thank you Michael. And, and thank you, Jeff, for that great response. So we have a, a ton of questions coming in and yes. I don't know that we'll get, be able to get through all of them, but, but I, let, let, let's, let's try. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in order. Um, the first question was, uh, it seems difficult as there are those that don't believe that climate change, global warming is even an issue. Speaking exactly to what you were just talking about. It's hard to get people to recycle even when there's a bin nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's no question mark there, but, but thoughts about that? Yeah, agree. I, I just think um, 
people are learnable and educatable. And I, I've, um, I feel like I'm one of those people. I mean, I, I didn't really think this was an issue that I could even think about or address as important because it was so inevitable and what could one person do anyway? So why not, why should I recycle? Because it doesn't matter if what bin I throw this tin can and that's not going to save the planet. But, but I think people learn from people in their lives who they model uh, and, and that um, taking that attitude is not going to get us where we need to go. So all we can do is try to be steadfast, I think, in talking to people about it and living a life that's consistent with, um, with certain values. And, and yeah, that, that's what I would say. But it does, it does seem overwhelming. It does seem overwhelming. But so does, so does not thinking about it or doing anything. That, the consequence of that also seems overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So the next question you know, gets at some of these same things, but maybe in a more international sense. Why is it so hard to have, and is there no global focus, like from the United Nations or another organization, um, reflecting how connected we all are with this problem? We seem to forget this with the way that countries relate to each other and how they manage together, not really considering the impact on the individual and mental health issues. Uh, this is more needed than ever, and you show the extent of the problem and related symptoms and issues. Yeah, so I think the question is, uh, how, how do we even connect around this as a global uh, as a global community? And I mean, I think there are those conversations, right? For the Paris Accord and the UN meetings where are, there are these goals that nations set to try to get to the 1.5 uh, level. And, and um, I think the why it's so hard is, is almost um, on some level, the multiple other stressors that are related to climate change this is where it gets so complicated because people are alone and they're angry and they're, um, they're concerned about various other issues in the world. And so this one seems so big that what can one mere citizen like myself do about it? But I think Global citizenship involves all of us in the first place as individuals. And so, so I think that's where it starts. I agree it's so hard. That's just my, my one person meek little answer. So here's a question. And uh, is there anything you can tell us about current federal efforts to address climate change and mental health equity? Uh, and what we can do, um, what we do with the fact that there appears to be such a generational divide? I think it's a great question. I don't feel so savvy about this, but I need to learn um, more about this. There's, there are federal efforts in terms of mental health uh, legislation and funding, I think in terms of disparity. Um, uh, I think that's a really, a really good question that people could put in the chat also to uh, things that they're aware of. I'd also ask interview and Michael know um, know much about how to think about that. Michael, do you have any thoughts about that? Addressing the generational divide in particular? <laughs> that or the federal issue, yeah. Yeah, the federal, yeah. Um, yes, I, I don't, like you, Jeff, uh, I feel like I have more to learn in that regard. Um, I think we have um, a lot to do as, as parents, uh, grandparents of children to learn and listen from them and respond. I think your point is well taken that we have to validate the anxiety as real. And um, you know, I think uh, this is a place where passivity is, is not, I mean, it's an option, but it's not an option that's going to be helpful ultimately to younger generations. You know, the only, only thought I had to share about, about the federal level, and, and, I, and I don't know specifically about the climate change um, issues, but you know, our federal government, I think, has really struggled to, to have a, a, a strong voice in mental health equity issues. And, you know, it's, I think it's fairly popular to say, oh, we're going to put more money in, in, into mental health. I mean, there was some in the gun violence bill that there have been in various, you know, um, COVID relief funds. But, you know, what, one of the ones that, that I'm most aware of and concerned about is, is what I see to be the failure of the federal government to really enforce the parity legislation. You know, since 2008, we've had law in this country, it was part of Obamacare that says that insurance companies cannot impose barriers on mental health care reimbursement 
that are fundamentally different than what they do for medical illness. But to anybody who's ever been involved in getting approvals for, for, for mental health treatment, which is probably most people on this call, it's glaringly obvious that this is that this is um, is not the case. That insurance companies are still doing it, and you know, it, based on some of these recent class action lawsuits, what seems very clear is that insurance companies have made a calculation that if these things aren't being enforced. Why should they follow them? Um, and and you know, even the Witt case, which was a major step forward, was recently overturned on appeal. It's being appealed again, so it's, the the end is not written there. But I, I, I worry that the federal government can't even get its act together to enforce existing laws it's, uh, around mental health parity. It's hard for them to, to take on yet a whole new challenge. But we, got, we have to, I think, hold our, our representatives and senators accountable for that. Um, let, let me keep reading now. So, so uh, Dr. Richard Francis, uh, uh, I'm always thrilled that, Richard, that uh, Dr. Francis uh, is such a great participant in these grand rounds. It says, great talk, agree that disasters have uh, the greatest impact on those with addiction and mental illness. Could you discuss the role of self-help or 12-step programs, um, uh, like programs for communities that face a climate disaster? Yeah, I, I think in general, educated communities do the best in, in disasters. And that's the whole idea around community resilience. There is something I'm aware of um, called actually the community resilience model called CRIM. Um, I'm working with Lindy Grabby out of Emory right now, uh, learning that, and she's part of our resilience uh, call program. And, and their whole idea is to be able to teach resilience skills like in an hour um, so that people can actually uh, learn together and then uh, work with each other so that they are more prepared. And these are, are really mindfulness kinds of skills, but they also uh, um, connect people around the idea of att attunement and, and helping each other. I think any, uh, any program, um, that connects community members and people have a, a place where they feel connected. Those are people who are going to be more resilient in, in the face of a difficult event. Yeah. You know, I, I should have mentioned it in, in my introduction, but but I know, Jeff, that you've been involved in, in, in thinking about resilience and thinking about using tools like Echo, like this wonderful platform that you've been so involved in, to, 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 to teach around the country in this. And, and it, it reminded me that you have this three-year HRSA Behavioral Health Workforce Resilience Program grant. And I know you're working with, with some of the folks at Silver Hill on that. I wondered if, if there's a component of that that, that could be useful for, for climate change and climate anxiety. Yeah, I think, I, I think um, so there is that the ongoing climate communication program uh, that Joanna runs and uh, that link is in the PowerPoint right up top. There's uh, what I've learned most from that is, um, as we worked through the pandemic was that people are looking for a sense of community and a, a sense where they belong. And, and um, anything that can provide that uh, um, engages people and becomes a platform to share ideas. And, and so that's what I think is really important for communities as we start to prepare for these issues, not to say it, the storm's not coming, but actually um, how can we connect with each other and be prepared and um, know how to help each other and know what to do in these circumstances? And yeah, actually, yeah. And I think that um, you know, to build on that, the, the uh, fact that the 12-step recovery programs are so focused on fellowship and connection, it seems to me that's a place where people can find mutual aid, mutual support uh, through crises. I think we have time for one last question. So uh, um, Pamela Jimenez uh, asked, hello, Dr. Katzman, thank you so much for bringing this critical topic to the forefront and the terrific information. Discussions about psychological effects of climate change are often surrounding those suffering from extreme weather related activities. However, discussions surrounding ongoing activities that contribute to climate change, such as animal agriculture and destruction of our environment is, is largely absent. I'm beginning to work with individuals suffering from eco-anxiety and eco-grief who see the interconnectedness with other species in our environment and are concerned with ongoing exploitative and oppressive change-related activities. I have my theories, but why do you think these exploitative and oppressive climate change-related activities that are causing climate anxiety and grief are, are ignored? Yeah, that's great work um, that, that you're doing. I, I mean, and um, it's fantastic. I think uh, 
one is a lack of education, but um, about how eco agriculture is even connected to climate change. And, and um, as I said, most uh, medical uh, and psychotherapy organizations have endorsed pre-licensure education, but I think it's largely not there. And I think it's largely not there because um, faculty in organizations don't really know it um, because this is really kind of new information. So I think it starts with education about this and the work um, that you're doing is tremendous and I, I would like to learn from you. Great. Well, terrific. So, so let's wrap up there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katzman, uh, for your inspiring presentation and for really for everything you've done for Silver Hill as Director of Education and for and for the inspiring Grand Round series that, that you lead and will continue to lead. Um, and thank you, Michael, for joining us for, for and leading a, a really great discussion. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. As a reminder, those wishing to uh, receive CME or CEC credits, please complete the evaluation survey that will automatically pop up in the browser as the webinar ends. This now concludes today's Grand Rounds and our first half of the lecture series. We look forward to seeing you when we return on September 14th. Uh, for now, we wish you a happy and healthy summer. And I will end reminding you of what Jeff has taught me uh, about these terminations and I find very comforting. Uh, this was this is hard material as it often is, and you will be left alone in your office probably. Uh, so it's, it can be a little bit jarring, but um, we're, we're so privileged to have all of you here. Thanks for all the wonderful questions and we'll see you again in the fall. Bye everybody.